Well, shalom, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. It is May 29th, 2024, and we are excited about the lesson that we've been studying and that we have for you on tonight. So once again, we say shalom, welcome. We're going to wait a minute uh, to give others an opportunity to join, but our lesson tonight is there are many times when uh, through private emails and things like that, we get questions concerning uh, different aspects of understanding the scriptures and a perspective that you can use to understand the scriptures that will help you in understanding um, who you are and whose you are. And so on tonight, we're going to get into a word called Kedoshim, K-E-D-O-S-H-I-M. And this is a Hebrew word that means holiness, holy ones, or set apart. And so that's it for our music for tonight. So we're going to get into that study on tonight. I don't think it'll be too long. We just want to try to hit certain topics uh, based on the questions that uh, we've received. So with that, let us uh, pray, and then we're going to get into our shared page uh, on tonight. Jehovah, our Elohim, we bless you for this day. You are the one and only true and living God. There is no other. We thank you for this opportunity to go before your people and study your word together, studying to show ourselves approved, workmen not ashamed of our hire, rightly dividing the words of truth. We bless you and we praise you for all that you do. You're a great God. You're a loving father. We thank you now for this opportunity and bless each and every one that will participate in our study on tonight, those both live and those that will join us at a later time on some social media platform. And it's in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray this prayer, amen. Okay, with that, we're going to get into this lesson because I think it's very important to understand and get a little bit better perspective from a Hebrew point of view of what holiness, really what the Hebrew word means and how it relates to what Jehovah our Elohim was doing for us. I can see that in the background, that picture So we're going to try to get through that. They'll be shutting that off, and so we won't see that. But that's in my picture. All right, so with that, let's get to our shared screen. And We'll get to our slide presentation. All right. So our lesson in our Bible study tonight is going to relate to holiness and the word kedoshim, which means holy ones, that are part ones. It could mean that as well. And you will see when you use that meaning, it's, it will enhance your understanding of the scriptures. So with that, we're going to get into this word, Kedoshim. It's a particular study that is in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus, or Vayikra in Hebrew, um, 
basically is like the, the priestly book. It's a book that really deals with the sacrificial system and it deals with what it means. What does Jehovah mean? Jehovah is the name of the creator of the universe. What does he mean when he says this word to the Hebrew people at the time they were at Mount Sinai? So let's get into that. First, we're going to have an introduction. And we're going to be talking also about culture. Because what Jehovah was doing at Mount Sinai was developing a framework or a perception for which the people were to conduct themselves in their relationship with him, the creator, and his people, the children of Israel. And so we find that culture refers to the social behavior, institutions, norms that are found in human societies. So Jehovah was evolving a culture or a framework from which these people were to live in the land he was going to give them. Then they were to become a culture of priests that would take this information about the creator and the relationship man should have with the creator and teach others about Jehovah, our creator. We see that culture encompasses all a wide range of elements, including knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, and habits of individuals within this group. So this is what people are calling the law and saying we don't have to uh, worry about that anymore. But without that, then you don't have a frame of, work, of reference for which you can look at life through the lens that the creator would desire you to look at it. Because what we find that is, when life is completely fragmented, then it is devoid of reason. So when you don't have a set perspective of which to view things, then your view becomes fragmented and based on many different understand knowledge, knowledge and beliefs and everything else that are a part of what you call your cultural foundation or the foundation of life that you wish to lead. But without an orderly form of knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, and capabilities, habits, without that, then we find out that life becomes fragment. That is, it becomes devoid of reason. It's like in Genesis where the spirit hoovered over it over the vastness of creation and then began to order it and set it so that what? Man, when he saw it, would have a perception that he would view it from that was orderly. So it was full of reason. The understanding of culture gives direction to reason. So without the understanding of the knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, and capabilities, then what you find is that the direction and reason are lacking. Why? Because you haven't established a form of perception of knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, habits. You haven't developed that. In, and so then you bring in all these elements and what? It is devoid of reason. There are shared attitudes and practices that go along. And this is what Jehovah was doing at Mount Sinai when he brought these people out and established for them the knowledge, beliefs, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, etc. Culture involved a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterize an institution or, or group of people, which is what we're talking about. The second part of our uh, understanding is the Bible itself. Now, the one I used is the complete Jewish Bible, 
authored by David H. Stern. But what you see is the beauty of the word of God is that it can be translated in various ways that serve these purposes and others without obscuring the Bible's own purpose, which is, this is once again getting into what is the purpose of this Bible. It does what? Show people the truth about Elohim, about God, themselves, help you understand who you are as his children, relationships, how you relate to him and one another, and therefore you have what? The meaning of life. And it is to call forth the appropriate and necessary responses. So this is what the culture of the word is designed to do for the people of Elohim, the people of God. And so it's no we have fragmented the Bible into two sections in the Western culture, calling one the Old Testament and one the New. But according to Dr. Stern, there is no need to collect the first three quarters of the Bible into the Old Testament. So we call the, the uh, 66 books of the Old Testament, we call that's three quarters of the whole Bible. But we're only concerned in the church in many times with what? The New Testament. So what Dr. Stern is telling us is the Bible should be presented as a seamless whole, a unified word of Elohim or of God. Therefore, he, he has to compile this complete Jewish Bible for all humanity. So what he's done is bring show us how to bring both together. Now, most Bibles do have what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament, but it is a continuation process, not a stop. We don't have to do that anymore and then began in the New Testament with a whole new set of what? That knowledge and, and, and values and other things that take away from the understanding of the culture and the evolution of the culture for which the creator of the universe has set before each and every one of us. So in getting to this, we want to understand, we understand what this culture is. We understand how culture works. And now we're going to get into what Jehovah designed and this holiness or this set apart people, his holy ones, why it is so important that we utilize the word of God to enable us to develop a perception of how we are to live, which is basically the culture for which we are to exhibit to all other peoples. Let's get into Exodus, which is about the story of the children of Israel leaving the land of Egypt that they had been through upward 400 years and going to the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by Jehovah, the creator of the universe, that he would give to their seed, their descendants, that land. But the people that were already there, at the time Jehovah made this proclamation to Abraham, the time of their departure was not yet. So then we look at in Exodus 19 verses 1 through 6 and then verse 9 we see that in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. So now he's taking them to this place that he's going to sit down and begin to develop because they had been away from much of the word and the understanding of what their ancestors had done in terms of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for many hundreds of years. And so now he brings them to Mount Sinai who began to develop for them a perception of how they should look at things. In verse two, he says, 
for they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. Verse 3 of Exodus 19. And Moses went up to Elohim on this mountain, and Jehovah called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob. Remember, that was one of the names that Jacob had, and the other was changed to Israel. And tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So Jehovah is telling them that he had brought them to this place to introduce the manner in which they are to live their lives. And Moses was told to write these things down so that the people would have them. Then he says, Jehovah says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So once again, this is that nation of what? Kedoshim or holy ones. So you ought to be a kingdom of priests and holy ones in this nation, Israel. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel, Moses. Jehovah said to Moshe, see, I am coming to you in a thick cloud so that, this is verse 9, the people will be able to hear when I speak with you and also to trust in you forever. So now Jehovah is establishing for them that they're going to hear his voice. So these words that Moses is going to be writing down as he hears from Jehovah and he's told to write these things down, the way the people will know he's not making anything up is because that cloud, the Shekinah glory or the glory cloud, in many cases, it is referred to would be an indication to the people that yes, his presence was in the tent of meeting and Moshe or on the mountain. And Moshe was in fact, what he's recording for them, they ought to do what? Trust in you, trust the words he's written forever. So you can't disavow the Old Testament, especially the first five books called the Torah, because Jehovah has given us instructions here that this you are to trust forever. So the way we are to look at things are uh, based on this word. It doesn't matter that some of these things were part of other cultures because most of the cultures were evolving through word of mouth. There were writings, there were caught, there were different things going on. But it was at this time that Jehovah decides to bring these people out, set them apart, he says, above all. In other words, you are different than all people. This culture I'm going to show you is different than all people. He says, the whole earth is mine. And I want all the people of the earth, basically, to understand that. So that whatever their culture is, what you're going to take to them is the one I'm giving you to continue and trust in forever. Then when we get into the, we find in the book of Romans where Shaul said, now if the hollow or the offering, offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole loaf. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. He said, but this is Romans 11, verse 16 through 18. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, a wild olive, were grafted in among them and have become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree. 
So now those Gentiles or non-Jewish people, they're just Jews and Gentiles, have been joined together because believers in Yeshua have been what? Have been grafted in to become equal sharers in the rich root of the olive tree. So as believers in Yeshua, we have been grafted in to this rich wood, root, which is the word that includes the promises and everything else that were granted to the children of Israel. Verse 18 says, but don't boast as if you're better than the branches. No, you don't do that. Because now there's been this uh, displacement or replacement theology that says they are no more, the Jewish people are no more, and now the church has become the root. No, the church was developed thousands of years after the giving of the Torah. And so they can't be replacing what was already here and which we have been instructed to understand and follow forever. So we don't boast that the Jewish people are no longer part of this. He said, remember that you are not supporting the root. You're not supporting the olive tree is symbolic of the children of Israel. You're not supporting them, the root of the word, this rich root, this olive tree, this word that they have been given is supporting you. Therefore, we are to be as if we are children of the creator. Just as he set apart the children of Israel and he has then, because of what Yeshua has done, grafted us together grafted in they would take a part of it of a tree of, of the olive and and tie it in and click so that the root the foundational nourishment for this new branch would flow to it so the torah flows to all the children of god children of elohim then we see in this word kedoshim, which is a Hebrew, and it means holy ones or set apart ones. So wherever you see that word holy, it's referring to this Hebrew word, and it can be holy ones or set apart ones. And Jehovah will respond to this throughout this book of Leviticus, which in, Le in Leviticus 19, 1 through 20, 27, Jehovah begins to lay out for the children of Israel who were supposed to be a nation of priests, but had, through disobedience, who had violated that. But that's why the book of Leviticus is called a priestly book in, in, in some instances. Uh, it happened where? In the wilderness. So... Kedoshim, this holy ones, we will see running throughout the Bible. Be ye holy because I, Jehovah, your Elohim, am holy. So now let's look at this word holy or these holy ones because we understand those are people who have been set apart for demonstrating a culture that is represented by the word of God. We look in Leviticus 20, verse 6, and we see the person who turns to spirit mediums and sorcerers to go up fornicating after them, Jehovah says, I will set myself against him and cut him off from his people. So if you're doing these things, if you're bringing all these fragments of things outside of the word, then you have set yourself against the word, the creator of the universe, because he said to us, 
you are to do this forever. He says, therefore, consecrate yourself. You people must be holy or set apart or my holy ones because I am Jehovah, your Elohim. That's the name Jehovah and your Elohim means God. In English, it's God. He says, observe my regulations and obey them. I am Jehovah who sets you apart to be holy. So that you are his set apart ones. Therefore, your perception is shaped by the scriptures. And it is from the Tanakh that we get the Torah that are the instructions. That's what Torah means, instructions for people that Jehovah has set apart to be what? Holy or different or to use the word to live your life. Then we see in Leviticus 20, verses 24 through 26, he says, I am Jehovah, your Elohim, who has set you apart from other peoples. Therefore, you are to distinguish between what is clean and unclean animals and between clean and unclean birds. So these are things you're supposed to do based on his instructions to you. And he says, do not make yourselves detestable with an animal, bird or reptile, that I have set apart for you to regard as unclean. So things that he says to us in this culture, there are things you should what? Eat, animals you should eat, animals you shouldn't. You don't eat these other animals that you shouldn't eat because that is not for you. Other people can do what they want with it, but they're basically doing it out of what? Necessity or an ignorance. But you ought to then teach them that my children, my people, those in right relationship with me have a particular diet that they're going to abide by. He says, rather verse 26, you people are to be holy for me. So you are my set-apart ones. You're my holy ones. I, Jehovah, am holy. And he's set apart. There is no Elohim, no God like Jehovah, the God of the Bible. He says, and I have set you apart from other people's so that you can belong to me. So now this is what a kingdom of priests will do. They will be living this information, this kedoshim, this holiness, this set-apartness. All of that is involved in this word kedoshim, and as we're dealing with it, we have to think of all these concepts so that we can properly understand what Jehovah is saying to us, and then live that life before others. He says, you belong to me. So we've been grafted into it as believers in Yeshua. And it is our job to take this understanding all over the world and teach others, which was the instruction of Yeshua to his disciples and therefore to us as well. He says, go into all the earth and teach, immersing them or baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh. So we see then that this set apart, this holiness, gives us a framework from which we can view ourselves in relation to the creator of the universe, Jehovah, and to others. In Leviticus 22, verses 31 through 33, he says, you are to keep my mitzvah or my commands and obey them. I am Jehovah. You are not to profane my 
holy name. You profane his holy name when you make a mockery of what he has instructed us to do in relationship to our culture that he has established for us. He says, on the contrary, I am to be regarded as holy, as different from everything else everybody else is telling you, he says, among the people of Israel. If we don't, as children of God, if we don't reverence the name, the attributes, the instructions of Jehovah, our God, then what do you think the world is going to do? They won't have any respect. So therefore, you're not, well, you're profaning his holy name. He goes on to say, I am Jehovah who makes you holy. So he's given us the Holy Spirit. And this for the believer, because of our belief in Yeshua, makes us set apart. He said, I brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Jehovah. So, again, we understand that this holiness, this is that word again, Kedoshim. So we want to be familiar with that word so that we can begin to study the scriptures and utilize that word to understand our relationship to the word and our relationship to the creator of the universe, which he told us to adhere to forever. Then in Leviticus 23, chapter, chapter 23, verses one through four, Jehovah said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, the designated times of Jehovah, which you are to proclaim as holy convocations or gatherings, they are my designated times. So he, start, he starts out in this proclamation that he's making to say, these are whose time? These are his designated time. These are times when we should come together and think about the word and our relationship to him, the creator of the universe, and to one another. He starts off with work is to be done on six days. At this time, there was day one, day two, day three, what no name on the days. All of that is different pagan names that were brought in later. But it was day one, day two, day three, day four, which was demonstrated in the book of Genesis in creation. He says work is to be done on six days, but the seventh day is a Shabbat or a day of rest, of complete rest. A holy come. It's a whole, it's different than all other days for his holy one. You are not to do any kind of work. Work that you normally do in your profession, whatever that is, you are not to do it on Shabbat. It is a Shabbat for Jehovah, even in your home. So your way you live and the way you do things should be in line with Shabbat. He says, these are the designated times of Jehovah the holy convocations you are to proclaim at their designated time. So if you go to the book of Leviticus chapter 23, you will then see those times of the year when Jehovah's people are together in some form. There is no temple, so we you can't gather there. But wherever you are in whatever your community is, whichever group you're with, adhering to the instructions of Jehovah, you are together on these times because these are designated times that Jehovah has set apart for us. It doesn't mean you don't gather at any other times. You can do that, but you must gather at this on these days because these are the days in chapter 23 that Jehovah has told us that we are to proclaim and honor. All right, so that, that's about as much as I wanted to cover today. 
because I want us to understand the value of the Torah, those who study with us, and why it's so important that we study that on our Friday night Bible studies as we go through the Torah from Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy, the first five books. This is our fourth year of doing that. And this helps us understand why that is so important and why we need to do it. So with that, I'm gonna stop my shared screen and we're gonna pray and dismiss for my lesson for today. Jehovah our Elohim, we bless you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you for those that have joined us and for those who will join us as this word will be posted on other forms of social media. We thank you for blessing, for God. Wherever there is obedience, there is blessing. There is obedience in studying your word. So we know that as we study to show ourselves approved, that blessings will flow into our lives. And so we bless you and we praise you for all that you do. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. All right. I will see you all on Friday for our Shabbat night service. Shalom.